Okay, I'm going to do a real quick study here on dispensationalism, understanding dispensationalism. I've talked about it in different studies, but I don't actually have a dedicated teaching on the subject of dispensational theology, if you will. Okay, and uh, we're going to start out in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This is the greatest proof text in your entire King James Bible on the thing of rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, this study is very important for you to be able to understand the catching away of the bride of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, this is a key foundational principle for you to understand. And it is an, a commandment for a New Testament Christian to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you do not rightly divide the word of truth, uh, God will be ashamed of you. You will make a royal mess of the scriptures. Again, I have a study on uh, non-dispensational Christian contradictions. Uh, the, the Bible is a complete total mess if you do not rightly divide it. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, what were they doing in the Old Testament? They had a Levitical priesthood. They had a temple. They were, they were uh, committing animal sacrifices. How do we do that today? No. What is that? That's rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. You look at some things in the Old Testament, you say God's dealing with the nation of Israel. He's no longer dealing specifically with the nation of Israel the church age, as it's called by many, he's dealing with both Jews and Gentiles. Things changed. I mean, even the most uh, ignorant, just newly saved Christian can see there's a distinction between Old Testament and New Testament. There are two different parts of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. You have to rightly divide that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, you'll need a King James Bible for this study, by the way. If you don't know why I say King James Bible, watch some of my videos on that. It's very important to have a Bible that comes from the real manuscripts, not the Egyptian manuscripts that are used by the Roman Catholic Church. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I had somebody write to me recently and they said, Well, couldn't this mean... Uh, that we're supposed to divide Scripture from the stuff out there in the world that's in error. Uh, no, because it doesn't say that. It says rightly dividing the word of truth. This is the word of truth. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word, lowercase w, word, written word there, is truth. Okay? Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. That's what the Scripture says. Faith cometh by hearing. Romans chapter 10. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God's Word, this written scripture, is your only physical connection to God that you have here on earth. That's why it is the most important thing in your life is this King James Bible for English-speaking people. All right, There's a lot of uh, translations that will match this type of translation. Uh, this thing comes from the received text, the majority of Greek manuscripts that are found will underlie this King James Bible. In German, you have the Schlachter 2000. Um, in Spanish, I think it's the uh, uh, Reign of Valera. There's a, there's a controversy in each language out there because the devil and his little Jesuit buddies that are trying to get everybody back under the control of the Roman Catholic Church, they are always coming out with their newer, newer updated versions and things. In English, it's the most crazy of all the different languages out there. There are so many new versions in the English language. It's ridiculous. The English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, American Standard Version, New American Standard Version, NIV uh, 1974, NIV 1978, NIV 1984, TNIV, you know, all this stuff. T or NIV 2011, they're always updating it, okay? But you look at where those manuscripts came from, they are used by Catholicism and they trace back to Egypt. The King James Bible and the Schlachter 2000, the Reign of Valera, they, uh, for the Spanish-speaking people, can't think of the French one right now, Diodati or something like that, but they all go back to the received text, which comes from Antioch. They're Syrian Bibles, okay? Read Acts chapter 11, verse 26. The disciples are called Christians first in Antioch. There were no great movements in your New Testament of Christians doing things over in Alexandria, Egypt, where these false Bibles come from. Okay? Very important to understand that. But the Bible commands, not suggests. 
it commands Christians to rightly divide the word of truth. And how do you do that? By studying. That's what we're going to do today. Now, what about the word dispensation? You say, I won't believe it unless it's in the Bible. Well, good for you. But we're going to show you here in the Bible where the word dispensation first occurs. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to start at verse 16. It says here, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. There is the first time that the word dispensation occurs. I want to explain what it means here in just a minute. Ephesians chapter 1. When Paul says, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, we're going to see that it was actually the gospel that we have today is it was committed to Paul. All right? But when you see dispensation, uh, an, uh, another way that the word can be used in the English language is if there's a room full of people and I'm going to be giving out food to each one, each buddy, every person gets a sandwich and a, and a bottle of water or something like that. What I do is I take the food and then I walk around and I dispense it to each individual person. You see, that's dispensation. So God, in like manner, God says, okay, this time period here, I'm going to dispense my grace this way. This time period here, I'm going to dispense it this way. And we're going to see that God has dispensed different methods of salvation. Right? And again, people are going to go, heresy, heresy. Look at the scriptures before you make up your mind. Okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 10 through 14. We'll read here. Okay, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on, on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory." Was that true for people in the Old Testament? No. They were not sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? The Holy Spirit could come upon them and leave. That's why you see David at one point saying, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know? They, that, that was a thing. I mean, the guy, you know, he's, they're, they're walking along and, and the ark of God, they're carrying it and, and it starts to tip and, and he goes, Whoa! and he reaches out and grabs it and God drops him dead. Is that the same thing we have today? Do we have the ark of God that we carry around the day and you get dropped dead for touching it? Some guy goes out and picks up sticks on the Sabbath day and God goes, bam, kills him. Or, you know, take him out and stone him, kill him. Is that the same thing we have today? No. God dispenses different rules for different time periods. All right? And, you know, you can get really, 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 really technical about all this stuff and get into all the deep things and all this other... But we're not going to do that in this study. This is just going to cover the basics of this. If you want to, you know, dig a little bit deeper, let me show you. This is probably one of the big books here. This is uh, Clarence Larkin's book, uh, The Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth in the World by Clarence Larkin. Okay, and it's it's got some good arguments in it. You know, I, there's some issues as far as Clarence Larkin. I'll show you on the overhead camera here. Clarence Larkin uh, does quote from the Revised Version of 1881, the Westcott and Hort Bible, the first Bible made by quote-unquote Protestants that used the Roman Catholic Vatican manuscripts. So, you know, I got some issues with that. But, you know, he's got some good stuff in here. But this one is like, eh, you know, I don't really totally recommend this one because it has some issues. This is the one here. If you want one, I recommend this one. Okay, this one is, I don't have the cover on this one because I had to buy it used. One Book Rightly Divided by 
Dr. Douglas D. Stauffer. Um, Doug Stauffer is, he's, Clarence Larkin's been dead for a long time. Doug Stauffer's still around. He's, he's a Bible-believing Christian. He will not quote from the Revised Version or the New American Standard or any of those other satanic Bibles. You'll get King James Bible quotations in here and a very thorough book. And ironically, it's actually out of print. And you say, what in the world? And I was going to, you know, I was thinking, man, you know, I wonder what's going on with this book thing here. And I, I kind of prayed about it. And here, uh, I think it was actually uh, yesterday, I got an email from Doug Stauffer, his newsletter that he sends out. Uh, you can go to BibleDoug.com if you want to see, you know, uh, this book or what he's doing. And he basically said he's coming out with another edition of this. And it's going to be a prophecy edition you know, specifically giving a lot of the prophecies. And uh, Brother Doug Stauffer is a solid pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away believer, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, he, he's just, he's come out with videos defending the, the you know, what you would, what many people call, people call the pre-trib rapture. And I, so I don't think he's backed off on it. You know, I have to put that little thing in there because so many of the brethren have. And it's just like, you know, I don't think he has, but, just be careful on that. But, you know, very good book on rightly dividing the word of truth, on dispensational teaching. I recommend it. I have bought, you know, the reason I have this older one here is because I've given so many copies of it away. It's a good book. Next, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll see the next, the third reference to dispensation in the King James Bible. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now you're going to actually see that Paul clearly stipulates that this dispensation... This gospel that he preaches was given to him, and it was a mystery in time past. Let's look at, that, at this. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Now, let me just pause for a minute there. Okay? This is not a title, dispensation of the grace of God, because the grace of God is there in any dispensation. Okay? Understand that. What Paul is saying here is the dispensation of the grace of God. God giving grace to people in different time periods, different dispensational times. He says, that dispensation, this is what was given me to give to you. So let's continue. Verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Did you get that? As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. In other ages it was not known. People say, you know, I have a whole study on the thing of this heresy where people will come out and they'll say they were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. Absolute total lie. Absolutely a lie. That's why Jesus, when he was telling his disciples how he was going to die on the cross, they're going, be it far from thee. That's not true. This is, you know, they were, they were rejecting it. And even when Jesus died on the cross and rose again the third day, he's walking around and he's like, ought not Christ have suffered these things? You know, isn't this supposed to happen? And they're like, we don't really know what happened to Jesus. We, we don't really know. You know. They weren't being saved by looking forward to the cross. You know, Don't fall for that nonsense. That is a lie. That is a total lie. But you see this thing here. It was a mystery in times past. And you can watch my study on the thing of, uh, it's on my main channel, um, the thing of the, the were they saved by looking forward to the cross. I forget the exact title of the video. But uh, one other place to go to here, Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians 1 verses 25 through 27, the last and final, the fourth mention of the word dispensation. It says here, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, what is the mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now that's a mystery. 
That's a great mystery to a Jew that still believes that they're under the Old Testament. That God himself could be manifest in the flesh and you could have a personal relationship with him and you would actually become part of his body. That's a great mystery. They had no idea about that in the Old Testament. Now there are some things that kind of foreshadow and kind of look, you know, kind of point that direction, but there's no clear, boom, this is the way it's going to be. It was a mystery. But it's been revealed. All right. Now, we're going to get into what I teach. I believe that there are seven different dispensations. And again, the brethren can fight back and forth on this a little bit and kind of fight on some of the timing of when this happened or when that happened. We're not going to get into all that stuff, okay? I'm aware of a lot of the arguments back and forth, but we're not going to get into all that. I'm just going to show you what I believe, what I teach, and it's just going to be a very light study here from here on out. Well, somewhat light. But uh, I made this little chart, just kind of drew it out just to, to kind of show you what I'm talking about. Here's my dispensational chart. <laughs> okay, it starts out with eternity this way. God creates the world. You have the Garden of Eden would be the first dispensation. Then you have before the law, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, under the Mosaic law, the laws that God gives to Moses. That lasts until John the Baptist and the kingdom gospel come in. That lasts until Jesus dies on the cross, which brings in the church age. Then you have Daniel's 70th week. Okay, this is the, this is the gap here between the 69th and the 70th week, the church age. Daniel's 70th week, the thousand-year millennial kingdom is the final one, and then you have new heavens and a new earth here, and eternity this way. All right? Now, that's very basic. And again, don't start jumping up and down and, well, what about this? What about that? I'm just trying to make a basic study here. All right? Let me shut my camera off overhead here because I don't need it. I don't need to have a big, huge video file with just my hands moving. <laughs> Uh, from here on out because I just wanted to show that little drawing there and I'm not going to make it available or anything else You know, I mean uh, Doug Stauffer's got plenty of charts in his book and there are plenty of other charts out there So I'm not making this thing available. I just want to show I believe that there are seven dispensations and I'm going to tell you the why uh, the reason why here later so you have uh, the first dispensation the Garden of Eden now what was salvation in the Garden of Eden Looking forward to the cross. <laughs> Grace through faith. Uh, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Uh, the Garden of Eden, salvation was works alone. And now every time that, and I need to say this before we continue, every single time you have a dispensation ending, there is a miraculous event, a miracle, something supernatural happens that ends a dispensation and begins another one. Every time God ends a dispensation, he will supernaturally do something on the earth that cannot be denied, that it was God's doing, and a new dispensation will begin. Okay? It'd be like seven people in a room, and the Lord comes around and says, here, I give this to you. Sarah. John, I give this to you. Betty, I give this to you. And he goes down through the list. He's dealing supernaturally with each different dispensation at each different person in my little analogy all right and each time he does gives them something different he's giving them similar things but somewhat different he's actually physically coming in there and doing something supernatural and so it is with a dispensational teaching all right every single time that god ends a dispensation and starts another one something supernatural happens so what was the miraculous end to the garden of eden sin and death. Adam and Eve would have lived forever if they hadn't taken uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They would have lived forever. So what was the miraculous, the miracle ending that happened there? Death, sin and death entered into the world. They became mortal. They were immortal. They became mortal. That's pretty significant. Let's look about this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the, into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. 
For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Oh, I'm sorry that's not in there. Okay? There's no grace through faith. There's no looking forward to the cross. Uh, that stuff is not there. All right? God says, Adam, and he's walking and talking with Adam, by the way. You know, Adam can hear his voice. And they're walking and talking together. So you don't really need faith when you're talking directly to God. All right? And he says, Adam, you want to live forever? Don't eat of that tree. Okay? What happens? Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the servant, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. That's true. But now look, she adds to Scripture. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God didn't say that. Eve just added to Scripture. That's a problem. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, denying God's word. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and he treated it to be desired to make one wise, look out for that, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, miraculous event, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Okay, jump down to verse 22. You see the blame game there. They're fighting back and forth and things. You know, uh, well, you know, the woman, she did it. Well, and the woman says, the serpent, she, you know, he made me do it. <laughs> you know, but look what happens here in verse 22. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. See, before Adam and Eve, they didn't know what sin was. Now they did, or now they do, rather. And now let it, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And the tree of life, by the way, shows up at the end to millennial kingdom. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. So you see the thing there. Salvation is don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They do it. Sin, sin and death enter into the world. Mortal life. And I believe in the theory that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that the fruit there was symbolized by grapes, and that that fruit actually was blood. Because the Bible prohibits in three different parts of the Bible, and I've talked about that in my FAQ, about prohibition of eating and drinking blood. But it prohibits, the Bible prohibits eating and drinking blood. And so I believe that when they ate that blood, now they have blood within their bodies. They become mortal. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Interesting theory. So you see, the first dispensation is the Garden of Eden. God dispenses to Adam and he says, You want to live forever? Don't eat of the tree of the garden, or tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Excuse me. That's it. Salvation works alone. There's no faith involved. It's works. They failed. The supernatural event that happened is man became mortal and sin entered into the world. And since then, we've all been born into that sinful nature. All right. What's the second dispensation? Well, we have before the law before the giving of the laws to Moses, before the Ten Commandments and everything else. Now, they're still there. I'm not going to talk in great detail about that. It's still wrong to steal. It's still wrong to, to lie. God's laws are written on every man's heart. Every man that's ever been born, God's laws are written in their heart. Okay, and I say man, including women as well. Mankind is what I'm saying. So nobody can say, oh, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know about God or whatever. You have to kill your conscience to do that. But salvation in this time is by faith alone. We're going to see about that. And the miraculous end to that time period is the exodus 
from Egypt. That's when it ends. They get out of Egypt, the, the children of Israel, and God starts to deal with them with laws. He sets up a priesthood. He starts to say animal sacrifices, all this other stuff. They were committing animal sacrifices in the past. That's true. But it's faith in this time. I'm going to show you that. Romans chapter 4. There's a lot of things that happened back there um, before the giving of the law that apply very much to us today. A lot of things are very true. Now, you've got to be real careful. You know, again, study, rightly divide, understand that. But, you know, there's some definite tie-ins there. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. We're going to see in a minute that this is where the faith thing comes in. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Now look here. His faith is counted for righteousness. Now, of course, the non-dispensationalists come along, and they'll steal this, and they'll say, See, Abraham was justified by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He had faith in what God told him to do. And that faith was accounted for righteousness. It was accounted there, okay, you've done this thing. God says, okay, Abraham, take your son Isaac up and sacrifice him. Abraham being a type of God, Isaac being a type of Jesus Christ in that scenario. And what's, you know, what happens? There's a ram caught in the thicket. The Lord says, hey, don't kill your son. Don't, you know, just hold on here. And he says, God himself will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. God himself is the lamb. A little future prophecy there. Very interesting. But you see there, again, Abraham is justified by faith. You just read it. But it's not faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's faith. God says, go do this thing. Go take care of this. Go sacrifice your son. Abraham had to have faith that God was going to take care of that situation. You just read about it right there. So before the giving of the law, they're doing what God tells them to do. All right? You know, and I know you could say, well, there's, but they, you know, there was some work involved there and stuff like that. Yes, but it's not a continual, perpetual keeping of the law or whatever else. So it's not technically the same as works. You know, the Garden of Eden. The works was there. The, the works salvation in the Garden of Eden is every day you get up, don't eat of the tree. Don't eat of the tree. Don't eat of the tree. Abraham, Abraham wasn't challenged to sacrifice his son Isaac every single day. It was a one-time event. Okay? Kind of like what God did with Jesus Christ. One-time event. So you see there, before the law, it's faith. Faith alone. But how does it end? Exodus chapter 2. Back to the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. It says, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac, or with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. And that covenant's never been disannulled. God still has respect unto the children of Israel, even though they are in bondage right now to the world. They haven't received Jesus Christ as their Messiah. See? We're seeing a repeat of history. All right. Sorry about that technical difficulty. I forgot to plug my camera in, and the battery died on me, so I'm back. <laughs> uh, anyhow, what we were saying there, um, I have a whole study on the coming Exodus. Um, showing that Moses and Elijah are going to repeat a lot of the things that happened in the book of Exodus. Very interesting in the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, not going to get into that big study here because it's already been done. But Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 22, it says here, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? 
And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I, shall, or when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto, unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the land, or out of the affliction of Egypt, unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the, of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters. And ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Okay. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. You say, did that stuff happen that God promised that it was going to happen there in Egypt and bringing the children of Israel out? Let's read Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus 19, verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. What happens in the next chapter? Chapter 20. God gives the Ten Commandments. The law. So what was it that ended? What was the miraculous event that ended that before the law time period? After the Garden of Eden to the giving of the law. What happened? Exodus. The Exodus, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt by all the signs and wonders that, that God did for the children of Israel and for the heathen Egyptian people to see God's power. And it's going to happen again, by the way. Very interesting. So again, we see another dispensational change and it happens. There's a major miraculous event. What about the third dispensation? Now we are under the law, okay? Meaning they are under the law. Okay? Salvation is faith and works. Now there is a system where they have to continually sacrifice animals. They have to don't, don't do any work on the Sabbath day. They can't do this. They can't do that. If you touch this, you're unclean until the evening. You have to go and you have to be washed and you have to do the sacrifice commanded by the priest and all this other stuff. Faith and works. Okay? Um, the guy's picking up sticks on the on the Sabbath, Sabbath day and he gets killed for it. Uh, he wasn't looking forward to the cross to be saved. It was an action that caused his death. Okay, so you can't say, oh, well, it was faith alone. It's always been grace through faith. God's grace has always been there. That's true. But just to say it's grace through faith and that's it. Uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. It was faith and works under the law. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Let's look about this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 26 through 28. Okay, it says here, 
Only thy holy things which thou hast, and thy vows thou shalt take, and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt eat the flesh. Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. Faith and works. They still had to believe what God was doing. They still had to have faith that God was real and that God was doing things because God wasn't physically there talking to them like what happened with uh, Adam in the Garden of Eden. But they had works, a system of works, sacrificing of animals. That's what happened. But uh, what was the miraculous end that ended that Old Testament law? Well, Luke chapter 16. Go to your New Testament. Luke chapter 16, verses 16 through 17, says here, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Now, of course, this is a big study and we're not going to get into it here. Jesus Christ did not come to say, I've destroyed the Mosaic law. He fulfilled it. Why? Because he's the perfect sacrifice to pay for sins. Animals aren't. Animals are a perpetual sacrificing thing. You have to continually sacrifice and sacrifice. You have to continually make payment for your sin. Jesus Christ came and paid for it once. And it's done. That didn't eliminate the, the Old Testament law. The law is there to bring us to Christ now. The law is there to convict you of the fact that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the message that, that John the Baptist preached. And now you have an ability to get saved one time. And His blood will cleanse you from all sin. You don't have to continually do the perpetual thing. So what is our salvation now? Faith alone. I'm getting ahead of myself. So now we have the fourth dispensation coming. Okay? Salvation is faith and works. You say, wait wait a second here. Faith and works? When Jesus is physically on the earth? Yeah, we're going to see about that. Faith and works. What is the miraculous end to that kingdom gospel time? Well, it would be the Jewish rejection of Jesus Christ and Jesus dying on the cross. God himself sacrificing his only begotten son to pay for sin. That's the miraculous end. Let's look about this. All right. Salvation, Matthew chapter 3. In this time period, this kingdom gospel, this time between... Uh, the Old Testament, and, well, it's technically still in the Old Testament. I realize that. Doctrinally, it's in the Old Testament. But you have Jesus Christ the King there offering the kingdom. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And again, I've talked about this in many other studies. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 says that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven in, is, only appears in the book of Matthew, and it is always, 100% of the time, a reference to a physical kingdom on the earth, with Jesus Christ as the king. All right? Let's continue. Verse 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. See, the law, Mosaic law, and the prophets, the prophets were coming and saying, The king is coming, your Messiah is coming to the nation of Israel. You know, the last part of your Old Testament there, you know, you go from Isaiah the whole way to the end, they're all prophets. So you have the law, you know, the um, uh, Torah, and then you have uh, sort of the historical books and things in there, and, and the poetic books and things like Psalms and Proverbs and whatever, and then you have the prophets, the end part. 
Verse 4, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And see, people will say, well, that's the Holy Ghost is like fire and things, you know, the, the tongues of fire that came down. No, there was tongues of fire, or tongues like as of fire in Acts chapter 2. Not the same thing. You say, how do you know? Keep reading. Verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There is salvation there. Through Jesus Christ, you're saved. If you get the fire... You get baptized with the Holy Ghost and you're saved. If you're baptized with fire, you go to hell and you burn. Don't ever let anybody deceive you into thinking that this is somehow fire of the Holy Ghost that comes upon you. No, it's not. Just read the context there. Read verse 12. But you see, John the Baptist coming and he is preaching Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven. Now, where does it end? Hebrews chapter 9. This is one of the ones that the uh, non-dispensationalists will very conveniently sidestep. They won't really want to talk much about this. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 17. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Jesus Christ, he says, I'm going to destroy the temple and raise it up again in three days. And they're like, you know, it took 30 years to build the thing. What are you talking about? Jesus was speaking about himself, okay? And now we are part, our bodies are, are, are also uh, the, the temple of the Holy Ghost. So we are like Christ. When you get saved, you're, you know, you're a Christian. Jesus Christ, you become part of his body. But let's continue. Verse 12, look at this. See about with the Old Testament. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, I'm real sorry if you're an Orthodox Jew out there and you're doing the prayers and the alms and all the other stuff and trying to keep the law. Those are dead works. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled that and said, okay, I'm not getting rid of the law. The law is there to convict you of sin, but now you need to put your faith in him to be saved. Verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. That's why in the, old, or in the Gospels there, technically it's in the Old Testament, before Jesus dies on the cross, you'll see this thing of Jesus heals a leper and he says, go show yourself to the priest and do the sacrifice commanded by Moses. We don't have that today. What's Jesus doing? Is Jesus preaching heresy? Jesus says to his disciples, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul says, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. Is there a contradiction? Well, if you're non-dispensational, yes. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, if you take time and study, if you're reading these verses along here, study this stuff. Don't just take my word for it. Study it. You want to go deeper? Get a copy of this book here, or the second edition when it comes out. You know, study study. You'll see I'm right. 
no glory to me, no, no pride or anything else. I'm right because the Lord showed me this thing. I studied for over 10 years before I went into the ministry. So don't tell me about it, you know. But you see there, a testament, the New Testament begins with the death of the testator, not before. And the New Testament did not begin with the birth of Christ. It began with the death of Jesus Christ. That's very important to remember. So that's where you see the end of this little short time where John the Baptist is preaching the kingdom of heaven and Jesus Christ goes out and preaches the kingdom of heaven too, by the way. The king himself is preaching. The Jews reject. They crucify their king. Pilate comes out and he says, Shall I crucify your king? What do the Jews say? We have no king but Caesar. And so, who has been the greatest persecutor of the Jews in the last approximately 2,000 years? Rome. First the Roman government and now the Roman Empire that has merged and, and become the chameleon Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic system. And if you think that it's just some kind of a religion over there in Vatican City or something and that they don't have political power, you are quite deceived. Uh, study the Jesuit order sometime. You'll see that the Jesuits run this country. Okay, I mean, Obama, I have a whole video on it. Obama just appointed a Jesuit to the Office of Religious Freedom. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. <laughs> the order that was designed is a military order to bring all people back under the control of Rome. And that's the guy that's just been, you know, one of these Jesuits has just been appointed to a, a position overseeing religious freedom. Oh, boy. So the Old Testament ends with that fourth dispensation. The fifth dispensation comes in the church age. Okay? And this is, ironically, you know, uh, the number five uh, is the number of death in the Bible. That's many, many times symbolizes death. But the number five also symbolizes G-R-A-C-E, grace. What's the greatest time period of God's grace? The church age. The easiest time to get saved and to live for the Lord is right now. Doesn't mean that Christians have always had it easy. Doesn't mean Christians have it easy today. If you're Orthodox Jewish and you live in Jerusalem or, or wherever, New York City, some places and things, where your whole family is Orthodox Jewish, you know salvation would mean you'd have problems. Okay? Uh, yes, it's easy to get saved right now, but it can cost you a lot. All right? But uh, how does, or what is salvation in the church age? Salvation is faith alone. All right? No works involved. Faith alone. What's the miraculous end? All dispensations have to end miraculously. Supernaturally, God performs a miracle at the end of each dispensation. We've seen it all throughout this study. So what ends the church age? Hmm. I just don't know. We'll just have to see what the Bible says. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The greatest portion of your New Testament defining what the gospel is for us today. 